Thanks for joining us. Legends and Losers is sponsored by our good friends at Oracle NetSuite. To turbocharge your growth, check out netsuite.com slash legends. Today, we hang out with the amazing Isaac Morehouse. He's the founder and chief executive of Praxis. We talk about how to design a legendary career, the power and the value of being an apprentice, why you should be your own credential, and why it is seminal for you to develop your own digital body of work. All right, all right, all right. The Ramones said, hey ho, let's go. And Tom Waits said, fishing for a good time starts with throwing in your line. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Hello, my legendary friends. Thank you so much for investing part of your life with us here on Legends and Losers. If you're new, uh, I hope somebody warned you. <laughs> and if you're a longtime listener, well, uh, I, I want to thank you from the bottom of the cockles of my heart. Our longtime friend and listener, Scott Athan, says, quote, warning, this podcast may ruin every other podcast for you. I've been listening to Legends and Losers since its inception. And I've been trying to put my thoughts into uh, about this groundbreaking podcast into words. First off, Legends and Losers isn't a podcast. It's a real podcast. Most podcasts are BS interview shows featuring a host and a guest who each roll through their talking points without really having a dialogue. Christopher Lockhead can't stop chasing zebras down rabbit holes to have talking points. <laughs> and that's the beauty of it. Legends and Losers is like a conversation among friends, but the friends are some of the most amazing people in the world, end quote. Thank you so much for your awesome iTunes review, Scott, and um, your incredible, incredible words of support. We have an amazing show today. Isaac Morehouse is the founder and CEO of Praxis. You can check him out at discoverpraxis.com. And uh, for more details, go to legendsandlosers.com and check out our show notes on this episode. Praxis has a very powerful and provocative point of view. Quote, the degree is dead, you need experience, end quote. And so what Isaac and his team have done, have built a service for people who either didn't go to college and now want to kind of apprentice, get their feet wet in the workplace, maybe build some experience and some relationships and go, or even for people who do have a college education, but for whatever reason, they feel like they want to spend some time doing exactly what I just described. It's a fascinating new service at a fascinating time in the evolution of, um, of um, education and particularly with unemployment at um, you know, virtually zero in the United States. Um, uh, finding the right ways to put the right people in the right jobs is a big, big question. And uh, that's a big part of what Praxis does. All right. So without any further ado, Isaac Morehouse. Hey, look up. I mean, the opportunity is literally everywhere. It's oozing out, you know? And so like, that's what kills me. And that's what excites me. And so to me, what, what we're doing at Praxis, we're helping launch careers. And that's kind of, to me, by, by getting people out there in the real world, getting them to learn by doing. And to me, that is that's the first step to entrepreneurship because the kind of people we work with, they're young people who are not at the point. They're like I was 10, 15 years ago. I didn't think of myself as an entrepreneur. I didn't think, oh, I want to launch a business. I just thought, I want a life and career that doesn't suck. I don't really know what that is. Yeah, I, I was kind of the same thing. I was like, wow, if I could make the rent on a regular basis and afford guitar strings and beer. Right, <laughs> and not hate my day horribly. You know, like I can tolerate monotony and hard work, but you know, can I do something that's like sort of interesting and I don't hate. And, you know, I didn't have any specific technical skills. I wasn't like, I want to be a doctor or a lawyer. I didn't have a specific, I was just sort of like, I don't know. I'm kind of, I'm a hard worker. I'm kind of good with people. Those are a lot of the types that we work with in Praxis. And so for them, the first step is really just getting out into the world and seeing what is business like being like, if you don't have a vision you want to execute on yet, that's okay. Don't feel bad. When you hear us say, Hey, you know, people aren't starting businesses. They should be. Don't feel like, Oh, I'm horrible. Cause I don't have any business ideas. Yes. I think people should feel fucking horrible. <laughs> but, but if you say, okay, I don't have anything yet, but I want to find somebody who does have a vision and who's building and executing on it. And I want to come alongside them and I want to work with them. I want to apprentice with somebody who is running a company, who's growing it and see what that's like. And then all of a sudden I'll be exposed to stuff I never even knew about. Oh, what's, what's sales ops? I'd never heard of that before. What is, I don't know. I didn't know that you did this, you know, marketing involved all this technical stuff. That's crazy. And then you start to find that unique intersection of things that you're good at, things that people value. 
and things that pay money. And when you find that intersection, you can't say, find say it that by again. thinking about say it. Say that again. Things that... Things that you're good at, things that people value, and things that pay money. Oh, my God. Listen, is it wrong for one man to love another man? <laughs> Isaac? It's so interesting because when I first uh, got invited to speak at schools, <clears throat> whether it was uh, high schools or colleges or whatever... Um, this was exactly a point that I was always on. It's like, listen, this is how you make money. You got to be really fucking great at something that people believe solves a giant problem that very few others can solve. And as a result, they value it. Translation, they pay a lot of money. Yes. You know, so for example, um, I don't know why this story's in my head, but it's in my head. I remember this time where you and I were talking about traveling earlier. I was in, I'm pretty sure it was Sweden, Stockholm, Sweden. And uh, my wife at the time calls me crying because there's a skunk living <laughs> under our fucking house. And the entire house smells like a skunk nuclear bomb, right? <laughs> and in that moment, I would have paid the Skunks Are Us guys $20,000 <laughs> to remove those skunks. So it's kind of like that, right? Yes, exactly. That, yeah, that's, and that's a huge part of what we do in praxis when we start with this boot camp before anybody goes and, and apprentices at a startup and we start with look in the real world two things matter your ability to create value and your ability to prove that to people and you know if you're if that you're, second part really matters right it matters a ton because if you're a genius and you're sitting and on nobody the couch knows it. nobody knows it so that's, you know ultimately that's category design that's it exactly and so you know you've got this and, and we're, we're not going to use the word personal branding because you'll punch me in the face i heard no that no one. we could talk about personal <laughs> but, branding but we've got just we this, have to talk about it in the context of category but we, right? we use this we use this term you know signal like and that's you know that's what people are usually buying when they go to college for example they're buying a signal to employers that says i meet some minimum threshold that's the thing that they're signaling and our thing is don't go buy a third-party credential. Be your own credential. Create your own signal that says, can let you, me show you. Can you just say that one more time to just make me incredibly yes, happy? Yes, Don't go buy a third-party credential. Be your own credential. That's the world. The, 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 the information cost has dropped so low with the internet that you can now let you can craft your own message be your own credential yes and you can let people know more about you than they would have been able to find out hiring a private eye a couple decades ago like if i google around and you've got a track record you've got a podcast where you're talking about finance every week and you've got a blog and you i see your great charts and graphs about finance and you're doing book reviews on goodreads and amazon and you've, i say oh my gosh here's a body of work this person is passionate about finance and they do something about it and if you come to work for me doing a, a financial type role mm. I'm going to look at that and I'm going to say, that's, that's way better than a static resume that says degree finance. That's right? so interesting, Isaac. So, and this may be a naive question, probably a very naive question. What percentage of HR organizations are doing that level of investigation on a candidate where they would, what are you doing on Quora and what are you doing on Twitter and do you blog on LinkedIn and are, do you have a podcast? Are you a guest on podcast? Are you getting... PR for That's some a great fucking. Uh, are you building wells in Kuala Lala Ding Dong or like what are you what are you doing right? If if there's a if there's an HR department that's larger than like one person, um, then they tend to be very very by the book, very sort of risk averse, bureaucratic, run through you know the standard process, not super imaginative. But if you have an individual who's hiring, let's say you've got a sales VP and they're hiring people under them. They're going to Google you. They're going to go look around. They're going to go and look at your social media. It's interesting because, you know, you, you were asking me earlier sort of, you know, why I wanted to have you come and do this with me. And, of course, part of it was an incredibly strong referral from Mike Maples. And so that, you know, and and that underscores a lot of things. It underscores the power of relationships and it also – I've been living – ever since Play Bigger came out and we started Legends and Losers – I've been living in this world where it's always apparent to me because 
being an author and a podcaster is is like I know nothing about it, right? So I spent 30 years doing one thing and I got to be good at that thing and I understood that thing and, you know, the world worked around me, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then you go do this new thing where like, it's it's kind of like my I've started Pilates in the last couple months. Oh, nice. Yeah. And if you want to feel like a dork who can't even move <laughs> your body, like you, you, you're like a spasmatastic <laughs> Fuck a tar- I don't even know what to call myself, right? So that's a great way, you know. And I've been doing yoga for a long time, so I'm used to feeling like the donkey in the class. Yeah, but I've this- done yoga with my wife a few times, and it's an amazing way to make me feel like a complete idiot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I have an awesome downward facing donkey. <laughs> Uh, and so, you know, from a, from a, I don't even, this is not a business, but I don't even know what to call all this stuff I'm doing, but, you know, writing and podcasting in this world is a completely new world. And so what I realized, of course, is other people make me successful. So A, there's the referral from Mike, but B, having taken just a, a, you know, a run down a zebra hole there, um, (laughs) the other thing I do is, of course, I Google your ass. And to your point, there's your LinkedIn profile and there's whatever other fucking press coverage I read about you. And then there's of course practices website itself. And then there's, I can't remember what all I consume, but I consumed a bunch of you. Right. Right. And after consuming a bunch of, and you use an interesting term and I've started to hear this term more often. I find it fascinating body of work. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's more than here's one thing that's done we talk a lot in praxis about learn out loud, show your work. Because if I come to you and I say, Chris, I want to work for you. And I'll even work for free for three months. I want to produce your podcast and I want to market it and promote it on social media and help it grow. And you don't know me from Adam. And I say, here, I did that for this other podcast and I show you it. That's, that's good. That's, that's pretty decent. But what if I also, you go to my website and I've got a blog and I documented the process. Okay, I'm launching a new podcast, day one, getting the mic equipment, getting the whatever. Day two, doing this. Day three. Teach the host how to use the software before the guest gets here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> get, the, get the microphones, two microphones going without a, without a metronome in the background, right? Don't, don't upgrade your software <laughs> 10 minutes before the guest gets here. But if you can see... The process by which I learned in addition to the end result, and better yet, if I went an extra mile and I said, here, I took one of your episodes, I cut it up into some promo clips, I created some images, I already did some free work for you, use it, use it if you want to, even if you don't end up working with me, right? And so like, there's something about let your work speak for you. so, So I find this fascinating. I find this really fascinating because I'm somebody for whom today... The vast majority of the people that I meet, Isaac, are people who've, you know, unless I meet them at a party around town or whatever, my wife's, you know, whatever. But like if it's sort of in my orbit kind of thing, um, I meet them and I wouldn't have thought this way until you, you put it this way, but I meet them as a direct result of my body of work. Yep. That is to say, they've read my book, they've experienced my podcast and they reach out to me and they have something to say yep and so I, it's i never thought about that okay so I'll, I'll give you a concrete example because i run into a lot of young people who say i want to be a public speaker and the first thing i say is nobody's hiring a public speaker there's no one that says you know what we need a speaker let's go find a professional speaker what people need is someone with mastery of something with someone who's known for something. So if you just want to be a public speaker in the abstract, like, good luck. You're not solving anyone's unique problem. But if you go out and you start doing some stuff, let's say you write a book about something that's interesting to somebody. And now there's somebody somewhere running a conference about the topic of that book. And when they say, who can we get as a speaker? They're going to go look at what people are talking about, are writing about, are doing something in this area. So it's the, it's the things you get. In, you're a speaker. You get invited to speak it, because it's funny. of what you've done. Because when they think we need somebody to talk about marketing and creating new categories and being bold, they find you because of your work. They don't say we need a public it, speaker. It's funny because you said you are a speaker and uh, I I have done a lot of speeches, 
and at the risk of sounding modest, I give a mofo of a fucking speech. <laughs> I don't doubt it. And I have no relationship of myself as a speaker. In other words, I don't go, oh, I'm a public speaker. Like, and that's I, it. I'm it's not, not seeking speaking identity. gigs. Yeah. I'm not – there's no tab on, you know, legendsandlosers.com called book Christopher to speak. As a matter of fact, the truth is – this is tangential, but – I, I don't want to do very much of that anymore. I, I mean, I, I like to do some of it, but only under very certain circumstances, uh, ideally with friends, companies, and people that I know and, and that kind of stuff because I'm I'm focused in other areas. But it's funny yeah, to say that if you set out to be a good speaker, there's a high degree of likelihood you're going to turn yourself into a dork. Totally. But if you set out to be a person of value yes. who becomes known for a niche that they own. And, if- and it can be any – I mean like pursue your interests out loud. I talk to people a lot and say, well, what kind of stuff are you interested in? We do this thing at practice. We call it a personal brand audit. Now, we didn't use the word personal brand. But reputation audit, you could call it. Or digital footprint audit. It's okay. I won't punch where, in the where face. We'll ask people. <laughs> Luckily, I'm far enough across the table. <laughs> I, I, I move really fast. <laughs> <laughs> I don't doubt it. I saw some giant killer survival knife on your desk over there. So yeah. I don't want to get on your bad side. But so we do this thing where we'll say, okay. I want you to take a minute and just write down in like one paragraph or a couple bullet points. Somebody new meets you for the first time or comes across you. How do you want them to see you? What kind of things do you want them to know about you? What do you want your sort of first impression to be? And so they'll write it down. We'll ask them to write down a piece of paper and everybody will sort of turn it in. And then we'll say, okay, now we're going to assign, you know, this person is going to take you. We'll assign people to, to other participants in the program and say, you got 20 minutes Jump on Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever, whatever. Look this person up. And then you write down, how would you describe this person based on your first impression? And it's a great exercise because then you compare the two. And so somebody might say, I'm someone who loves travel. I'm super passionate about financial literacy. We had somebody say this and helping people learn to take control of their budget. That's how they wanted to be known. The person who went and looked them up was like, Well, what I found from all their social media and everything I could find online was seems to like their family and care about family, seems to be pretty nice and likes movies. Has a cat. And I'm like, okay, (laughs) so if you want, if if I told you that I know somebody, and who knows, I, I might, I might be two degrees removed from somebody who's dying to hire somebody to help them write a book on financial literacy. They want to hire somebody to do copy editing and promotion. And they, and they were talking to me about the book. And I've met you before and I've seen all your stuff and I never knew that about you. I would never think to say, oh, I know a guy. But if you were living that interest out loud, then I would say, oh my gosh, hold on. I know this guy. So for younger people, but do you think this is true for everybody, Isaac? I think it is increasingly. Yeah. uh, You know, it's funny as you're talking, I think that's right. I'm I. You know, like we get approached very often now more than I ever would have thought uh, with people wanting to come on Legends and Losers. And so <clears throat> we go through a process of, of, of doing exactly what you're describing. I, I didn't have the language to put around it, but that's exactly right. It's like, okay, assuming there's something of interest and it's not an easy denial, which, you know, some of them are just an yeah. easy denial. When you but, tell them that they have to do a bike ride first and then wait an hour for the Yeah, for exactly. The <laughs> because the host is a moron and can't figure out the new upgraded software and can't get a hold of his 27-year-old technical genius and all that, yeah. Um, so, so if you say, okay, well, maybe this person's of interest, what do you do? Well, you got to go out onto the internet and look for some shit. What have they written? To your point, I, there's no podcast guest that I've ever said gets on Legends of Losers that I haven't heard speak. Probably on a podcast, but yeah. at least some kind of a fucking video, yes. a TED talk. I mean, get a TEDx talk. There's only 10,000 million TEDx. <laughs> and I love TED, but you know. Yeah. Right. Like you got to, you're right. You have to have not just a body of work, but some digital body of work. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's it's a new business card, right? What happens when when I Google someone? And and it's and it's more than like this superficial like strangers googling you. It's all tied together. So 
you know, what people used to call networking, which kind of has like a douchey reputation now of dropping business cards out of a helicopter. We, I, I think it's even worse than that. The one I can't stand is the email or even worse, the yeah. phone call that says, hi, uh, I, I'm calling because I would like to network with you. Oh, man. If somebody says that out no, loud, No, they say it. It's shameful. like it became a word. Like, no, that's terrible. Really? I don't need to network with you because if I'm not networking with – if I'm networking with you, you know what I'm not doing? <laughs> Surfing Surf. or having sex with my yeah, wife. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what. That's what I say. Uh, coffee kills your productivity. Not to drink coffee, but going to coffee. Hey, we should grab coffee and I can pick your brain. It's like, is there a reason? Is there a purpose? No, I just want a network. I just want you to be in my network. I, I, I am bombarded by these. I'd love to take you to dinner next time you're in San Francisco. Okay, so here we go. This to, is, to what end? Like, I'm somebody that needs a purpose. This is, and the, so if there's no purpose for the conversation, like it's it's wonderful that you want even you 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 want to take my stupid ass out for dinner. That's very sweet of you, but you know what? I can afford dinner and my <laughs> wife's Italian and she can cook. So instead of this kind of dead, let me use up your time version of, you know, networking, whatever you want to call it. I like to talk about building social capital. And so I think about it. It's the same. It's a value creation mindset. How can I build social capital? How can I do things of value to those around me so that they're like, hey, that guy's a valuable guy. And I'll tell you that you mentioned I'm here because Mike Maples said, hey, you should talk to this guy. Let me tell you how that came about because this is a great illustration. It's a crazy story. So I used to work at a place that worked with a lot of professors and academics, and I did you know, programs. It was a nonprofit. I did fundraising, whatever. And one of the professors there, an economist guy, super intelligent, super nerdy, great guy, Brian Kaplan. He's written several books. Um, you know, I, I worked with him in some of the programs, got to know him a little bit. Well, when I left, when I launched Praxis, I started a podcast at one point because I and just like for my own curiosity. Well, I brought him on because I wanted him to talk about one of his books. I brought him on, I think, two different times to talk about his books and whatever. Very great conversation. So he was like, hey, you know, I helped him promote his book, et cetera. And that's about it. I mean, we don't really keep up a lot, but like I knew him and I had, you know, helped him promote his book. Well, I get this email, this random email from Mike Maples saying, hey, I, I like what you're doing with Praxis. Let's let's chat about it. And so I'm like, why do I know that name, Mike Maples? And I go Google it. I'm like, oh my God, Mike Maples is like a total baller in the VC world. You just got <laughs> contacted and, and, and the heavens are, whoa! <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I'm like, oh, I heard Dun -dun -dun. about Tim Ferriss recently, all this stuff. So when we, have, when we call, when we're chatting, we do a phone call, I said, well, how did you come across Praxis? And he said, I read Brian Kaplan's new book, The Case Against Education. And I was really fascinated in, you know, what he talked about in there, which is basically like college is really inefficient. It's really wasteful. And he's like, so I called him I, and I wanted to know more. I asked him, like, what do you think? And he's like, you know, he gave me sort of a pessimistic view. Like, I don't really know. There's not a whole lot you can do. And he said, I asked him, is there anyone doing anything that you think is helping, you know, innovate around this problem? And he said, well, there's this one guy, Isaac Morehouse, at Praxis. Now, Brian didn't have to say that. And he didn't say it just because he knew me. He said it not only because I created value for him by bringing him on the podcast, but because he'd also seen the track record that Praxis was doing real things. You know, he was watching it. Yeah, but you, you did the two things, right? You delivered real, meaningful value. You have an absolutely unique, innovative idea uh, you are a natural, intuitive category designer, and what you do makes a fucking difference. So, so you get like a hundred tick marks on. You know, if you think about product, company, and category, yeah. right? You nailed your product, which in your case is I don't know. You tell me more of a service than a product, yeah, but yeah. And and and, I, and everything I understand, you're building a wonderful company that delivers that wonderful service, right? Oh, yeah. But you took the step further, which is you explain to people how to think about the problem and solution that Praxis solves in a completely different way and position yourself as a, as a result in a, a niche or category that yeah. heretofore really had not existed. Yeah, and that's absolutely so right. So you, like, you, you told him how to think about you and he, and I don't mean this in a pejorative way, but after seeing the evidence, he parroted what you said. Yes. To the ding dong, the, no, sul like, the I got sultan of sexy so in Silicon Valley. <laughs> yeah, I got so excited that Brian thought to answer that question in that way to say, yeah, Praxis is doing that. Because and and when you say, you know, we sort of created this this category in his mind, I would never have thought of it in those terms until I read your book. 
play bigger. Thank you, by the way. I want to give like a Bill Walton level. And <laughs> let me tell you, play bigger is going to change your life. This is the greatest thing since John Wooden. I don't know. That's my <laughs> that's my best. Uh, but hey, here's what I know. <laughs> this buddy of mine sent me a text after the episode came out, and 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 I, I said it before. I'm going to say it a billion times. I don't give a fuck. Having Bill Walton in my life is the most random, <laughs> crazy, legendary. Like you just think, you know, to your point, right? You put shit out in the world. Yes. You you try to put good shit out in the world. I believe what my my buddy Eric Weinmeyer said: the world doesn't need more bullshit. <laughs> and so, well, I know I've been guilty of some bullshit for sure, but like I try, you know, super hard, right? But to your point, you put some shit out in the world, and one day. It resonates with Bill Walton. <laughs> and then and then he's on TV calling Warriors games with Portland. And d- have you heard how he does you this? You told me this is the greatest story. Because I'm a huge basketball fan. And the fact that he, like, works into his commentary, oh, he should be not better but different, like like my buddy Chris Lockheads. I mean, this is the most amazing It's crazy, yeah. right? Yeah, it, it's – it's, it's, uh... It's amazing. But but, any- but but thank you for that book because really I read that after I talked with Mike and he said, you should check out uh, this book. And so I got it right away. I read it. I told everybody on the Praxis team, we got to read this book. And it was one of those great moments where it was half like, okay, here's some stuff I need to do. But half like, here's somebody describing what we've already been doing and I just didn't know because – you know, the reason we, we were creating this category is just by necessity because our customers, they have a problem that they're sort of vaguely aware of, but they don't even really know it's a problem and they certainly don't know there's a solution and they certainly don't know that we have a specific solution. And so, you know, if you're doing something like selling tires, you know when you when you know when you want to buy a tire. Your, your tire goes out, what do you do? You Google it. So who wins? Whoever has the best SEO because people are looking for your product. Right. When you're saying... We're giving, we're selling a one year experience that's going to launch your career. Now. That's, I hate to interrupt you, but I'm going to. That's the distinction between fighting for existing demand and creating net new demand. Yep. And here's the crazy thing. You tell me, I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, go for it. You're, you're a good wordsmith. <laughs> <laughs> would, the, would your uh, school teachers back in the day have, have ever believed that, that you were going to be a wordsmith? No, although you know what, my grandmother on my mother's side, May, Mary, but May, you know, Scottish, right? Oh, he kissed the blonde, he's doing that, he kissed the blonde, <laughs> right? So, so, so May knew. Uh, no, my teachers, uh, they they really felt like um, uh, Christopher should pay more attention in class. That's really what a lot of it said. But so I think about what you do. There's this gap between a young person, whether they're, you know, whatever level of educated they are, college or not, or high school, whatever they are, where they're coming out of whatever educational experience they've had at whatever level they've had. You tell me, you stop me when I get it wrong. And they realize, oh, um, nobody taught me, like, kind of, anything about the working world <laughs> I mean, unless you're a doctor or an accountant I mean, yeah. unless you're on a you know you're a carpenter and yes. shit but like if you took humanities and you're like um okay great i have a bachelor in humanities whatever the fuck that means yep. and now what yep and even in fields like marketing right i mean oh I, I talk to marketing students all the time and 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 they're learning the discipline one would hope and yet I talk to them and they they look at me like I'm Moses with a tablet. No, I just talked to one of our business partners, uh, a company called ClickUp here in San Francisco. And they've brought on five Praxis apprentices. And he said that the VP of client success, who's hired several, he said, man, I love these Praxis kids because they're, they're eager and, and ready to learn. And they've kind of been locked into the mindset. He said, when I get college grads, they, even if they're marketing grads, it's almost worse because the stuff they're taught is like 10 years old. It just, it can't, it can't not be I, the case, right? I, I'm going to, this is going to sound horrible, but I'm going to say it anyway. So I have a dear friend, um, I, you know, see her on a regular basis and, and, and um, she had a son who was taking business in the local community college mm-hmm. here. And he was in his first year of business 
and uh, he uh, he had this marketing course. And so she said, "You know, would you mind? Would you mind helping?" I, of course, of course, of course. So he came over and we did a couple of coaching sessions, and he had a paper, and you know, blah blah blah. Anyway, <laughs> at the end, at the end of it, he says he says to his mother, he says, and he was I don't know, eighteen at the time or something like that. Uh, Mom, Uncle Christopher knows way more about this than the teacher <laughs> because um, I asked the teacher a bunch of the things that Uncle Christopher was talking about, and she didn't seem to really know it. <laughs> and so, but that's the problem you're trying to solve, isn't it? That's the, it. That's the disconnect. It. And what you described is perfect. So actually, right when I was reading your book. I, I'm like a metaphor person. I'm like a freak for metaphors. And then I mix them all and they get all, it gets all messy. But this metaphor popped into my head that really helped capture it. The, the category that we are designing is career launch. And we are not competing with college or alt ed or saying, okay, well, here's what here's where education fails. So let's slap some tech on it or let's make it a little different. We're starting, we're starting from first principles and saying, what does it take to succeed in a career and how can we engineer that? And so the metaphor I like to use is formal education is like riding a train. And however fancy the train is you ride, whatever train you ride, wherever you get off, maybe you get off after high school, maybe after grad school, whatever, you still have a problem. Careers are out in orbit. They're up in space. So you get off that train And you're like, okay, now what? How do I get to careers? And once you're out in space, it gets a lot easier to maneuver. And, you know, once you know the career landscape, there's jobs boards, there's recruiters, there's headhunters. Getting into orbit. That's what we do. We launch your career. Think of it as like the trajectory, the craft, the fuel, those things that you need to get from student who just gets dropped off the education conveyor belt or train, wherever that may be, wherever that is, you still got to get into the world of careers, and that's a big gap. That's yes. a huge yes. gap. Yes. And, it, I, you know, uh, my buddy Tim Rode and I have talked about this a lot. He's the founder of this unbelievable nonprofit called One Life Fully Lived. And uh, what One Life tries to do is bring uh, skills around, uh, you know, how do you, how, do you, how do you dream effectively mm. and take your dream and turn it into a plan and, and ultimately execute that plan. And as part of that, for example, he, he says, well, it's, it's insane that kids graduate high school and they don't know how to use a credit card. <laughs> they don't know how to balance a checkbook. Yeah. And we had Joe Decina on, um, on Legends and Losers, and he's the founder of Spartan Race. Yeah. Oh. And I, like the baddest Like ass. I know he created a whole new category, and I did one of those uh, – Tough Mudder, which is like in the his, category. His competitor, created, yeah. His competitor, yeah. Who he's, oh. who he's crushing. <laughs> it, ki- it kicked my butt. It was amazing. Yeah. But he said something funny, or funny. He said something profound, which was um, adult human beings in the Western world are really now the only species of animal on the planet that no longer prepares its young for the world. Right? And so, so we graduate kids from forget college, high school, yeah. to send them into college, they're going to be on their own. They can't balance a checkbook, right? And then to your point, they graduate college. And unless they're in a field where there is a, you tell me if this is the wrong way to think about it, a true apprentice-like paradigm. Doctors go yeah. through yeah, an apprenticeship. CD. Yeah, right. Right? Uh, architects go through an apprenticeship. Well, honestly, that's what, so if you're studying the humanities or something like that, what college is, is an apprenticeship to be a professor. That's what it is. You learn all the things that are rewarded in academia. So if you want to be a professor, great. But like none of those things are the same as the real marketplace. So why so, would you apprentice to be a professor if you're not going to be a professor? So walk me through. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a, is, is it mostly young people or do you have people who are? It's mostly young people. Our, our age range is like <clears throat> 18 to mid 20s typically. Yeah, okay. So if I'm a young person, I've just graduated with my humanities uh, degree or my art, you know, whatever degree. Uh, or maybe I'm somebody like myself who got thrown out of high school yeah, yeah. and I'm trying to figure some shit out. We've had we've had some people drop out of high school and do the program. 
it's so funny when you say drop out it makes it sound like i made a decision <laughs> <laughs> well in their cases that was <laughs> it, i got thrown the fuck out cuz i don't it, i don't know that we've, i don't know if they do that anymore honestly cuz oh, maybe they don't throw was, you out anymore i think they just like keep putting you in different classes you know maybe yeah you just end up with all the spe- you have lots of special friends <laughs> I don't know why Jimmy keeps sticking his finger up his nose, but that's all he seems to do all day. Yeah, I'll go sit with those guys and and, and uh, whatever. Anyways, I digress. Um, so regardless of where I am as a young person, I'm somebody for whom uh, there's not a clear path for me. Yep. And I show up at at, at your at your website or where, wh- what happens? T- yep. Take me, you know, uh, cradle the grave, so to speak. Yeah, on absolutely. The cycle. So. You come across Praxis somehow. You, you you hear one of us speaking at a conference. You hear us on a podcast or you see some stuff on Facebook or whatever it might be. And typically it's like, oh, now this sounds kind of cool because I know that I want a career that doesn't suck. And I don't know what that is. And I know that like there's too big of a gap for me to just start my career on my own. But I also know that I don't want to just sit for four years in college or for maybe two more years in grad school. I don't think that's going to get me there. So this could do it. Okay, let's check this out. And then someone will apply to the program. And we have a pretty rigorous application process. Does everybody get in and everybody gets a cookie here, Isaac? <laughs> not even close. I mean, I wish we could accept everyone that, that can know, apply, but we can't get not even close. I was at uh, uh, my uh, nephew, uh, his soccer game. And everybody gets, he's 12. Everybody gets to play. <laughs> No, and everybody gets to have equal playing time, and uh, he is a great scorer. He's an incredible offensive player, and uh, so he's subsidizing all the other players. By well, scoring here was the game. weird thing: <laughs> at the game I just saw him play at on Saturday, this past Saturday, um, they put him in fucking net. Oh, and I said to his mother, my extraordinary sister-in-law. I said, hey, Merritt, w- w- why is he in net? And she said, oh, well, everybody plays every position and we rotate him around and all. And I'm like, this is the craziest fuck thing ever. Because when I was 12 years old, you know, y- you could be on the team, but you weren't going to play if you, sh- if you sucked, right? And we weren't just going to have everybody be the goalie. No, you had to be one of the three people or whatever it was working to be the goalie, right? Mm-hmm. Like I had to earn my spot. Now, I played outfield and third base, and I had to earn that shit in Se- the second right. baseman here. <laughs> well, and did you have to earn your position? Oh, hell yeah, second base, and then I tried to earn my way on to being a pitcher, and I did. I didn't. I wasn't the best pitcher, but I had. I was like, I could pitch sometimes, and that was. But what they I didn't wanted. just put you in pitching because oh, no. you were just no, one of the guys I had to on the work team. Work and work and work and prove to them that I could get a. You know, yeah. Well, so okay. Can I take a rabbit trail on this? You, hey, listen. <laughs> have, <laughs> you ta- met, have you met me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking to the man who invented the category rabbit trail. <laughs> so, Look, there's a zebra. So this idea of a shallow level of understanding of a ton of stuff versus just getting deep in what you're – doubling down on what you're good at, I think is so dangerous. And that is how most of – the entire education. What do you think the right answer is? The edu- Well, I'll get there in a second. Okay. The whole education apparatus is like this. You think about it, how arbitrary it is. You got like seven subjects, you know, from when you're a kid for like the first 20 years of your life. And they're in like 50 minute chunks. Now tell me, when you get lost in something, learning to play guitar for the first time or whatever it might be, you're not doing it for 50 minutes. You're doing it for as many hours as you can until you're spent. When kids learn to play video games or sports, they need to get lost in it. And having this, okay, eh, bell goes off, you're done with what you were writing a poem, you're done. Now you're moving on to geography class. Now you're going to learn a little about this. And this idea of like, oh, you're going to be well-rounded. The people who are awesome, who kick ass, they lose themselves in things. They master them. And that doesn't mean you're going to get pigeonholed. If I asked you, who was Benjamin Franklin? What was he? You'd be like, uh, he was like a guy. I think who, he flew a kite, didn't he? He did Wasn't all he kinds the of stuff, right? inventor of the kite. He was an inventor. He was a <laughs> statesman. He was all kinds of stuff. But at any given time, he was lost in something, right? And the ability to lose yourself in something and master it, I would argue, because people would be like, oh, we need to have all these broad range of skills and make sure that kids don't spend too much time on one thing. If you let a kid lose themselves in something for a whole freaking year, it doesn't matter. What they learn if they master it is not just that thing. They learn how to master something. 
Yeah, how, and how that's much, transferable. As a teenager, how much guitar do you think Eddie Van Halen played? Oh, my gosh. It's, you know, that's... And this is something that's always driven me crazy. I, I You know, I never thought about it, though, Isaac. I got to tell you, I'm going to interrupt myself. I never thought of it in the context of the way the school day is structured. 50 minutes of this, 50 minutes of that. Are you saying that maybe Wednesday's math day and Thursday's art day and like, wh- what are you saying? You don't want to get me talking. About, I'm, I'm about as radical as it comes when it comes to education. How far did you go in your education? So I was homeschooled. And oh, that explains why you're so freaking weird. And it was basically like an unschooling situation because my mom was doing it by herself. My dad was in a car accident when I was like three and he was at home with us, but he has a head injury and we were taking care of him. So he wasn't really helping take care of us. So my mom's homeschooling three of us. She always wanted all kinds of curriculum. So she thought that taking care of your dad after this horrible accident wasn't enough that she would she homeschool. She had to hold, right, And exactly. how many of of you were there? Three of us. Yeah. And, so, and you have like, what, 17 or 18 children now? No, I've got four kids, but I do have I do have <laughs> For eight, a guy with no kids. I, I do have 18 nieces and nephews, though. So, well, but, that, that part I understand. But so, um, you know, to me, it's, it's, well, if you want to get into education stuff, I'll just, I'll recommend one book. And anybody who's curious about this, read this book before you come to any judgment. There's a book called Free to Learn by uh, Peter Gray. who's a, He writes for Psychology Today and other places. But check out Free to Learn. Some really fascinating stuff. But this brings us full circle to what we opened with about millennials and, and I don't know about Gen Z, the next generation after them, but being sort of the least entrepreneurial. There's something else that's true. And by the way, I don't I, – I want to be clear. I don't say that as a criticism. No. You say it as something that you would love to see change. It's no, an opportunity. Yes, yes, but but uh, I see it as systematic. So, so I, I look. It's fun to pick on the millennials for for <laughs> a guy my age, and, and and God knows I have, but I also have many. I mean, more than I ever would have expected millennials in my life who are doing mind-blowingly awesome things and so my desire to throw them under the bus dissipates almost daily uh and so i look at more of the systemic things like why is it you know so for example we know for a point of fact that the um and i don't want to be political and i don't mean this in a political way but the truth is if i if i understand the numbers properly the American people bailed out Wall Street to the tune of at least seventy billion. Um, uh, Sebastian Younger said it was over a trillion. Whatever the number is, it was a massive number. And we know that um, outside of Silicon Valley, the uh, number one way people fund companies is through um, friends and family, and number two is they go to the banks. Well, guess what? Bank loans to small business people. <laughs> I don't know if it's at an all-time low on a uh, population-adjusted basis, but it's it's way low. Well, they're stuck in the they, – they so, want you to have all this physical collateral and stuff. you know. So if you're launching a business that doesn't have – you know, that's not a old factory. But here's the even worse part, Isaac. And, and my friend Heather Clancy, um, she wrote this in our new book, Niche Down. And when she wrote it, I, I, I wanted to punch something and cry at the same time. <laughs> The people who fuck the economy won't fund the people who build the economy. So that's a systematic thing. And there are things like that, and it's why I was so excited to meet you. You are somebody who is creating a new category of – do you even think of it as education? What do you think no, of it No, I, I just call it career launch. Career launch. That's what it is. And whenever you're ready to do that – I love that term. To get, to get that – you know, get out into career orbit, as I call it um, – then we're there for you. And, and okay. So on the systematic side, and I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm like beating a dead horse and going overboard here, but I think this is key. And I think nobody talks about it because people, the, the, there is this conflation with the word education and the word school that is so strong that people are almost incapable of seeing the difference anymore, but there's a profound difference. Millennials are the most school generation in human history by a mile. The amount of hours in the classroom, after school structured activities, you know, graduate, you know, college, graduate school, the amount of homework assigned, 
There is almost no time for free. When a twelve-year-old has play. three or four hours of homework, it's that seems mental to me. Summer camps, everything is so structured for so many years, and we act. We literally have Chris. I'm, I'm not kidding. When we people join the Praxis program, we've got the first couple months. We kind of jokingly and turningly refer to it as a de-schooling process mm. because they're coming in and they're so conditioned for like twenty years. Okay, what do I need to do to get the grade? We're like, no, 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 no. You wouldn't go to a fitness trainer and be like, what do I do to get your approval? He'd say, you tell me, what are your goals? Do you want to get, you want to gain mass? You want to run a marathon? Are you trying to lose weight? And, and when we come back to them, what are your career goals? We want to help you work towards those. Well, what am I supposed to do? How do I, how do I win in the system? And it's like, no, no, no. You tell us who do you want to be and getting through Getting out of that sort of schooled mindset is really, really challenging. So I think, you know, the fact that... The other thing too, like this word apprenticeship is so powerful. You know, if I if I well, want to... It's old school, but it's good. No, but it's... <clears throat> there's something really awesome about it. It, 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 it. If I said to... So one of the most legendary uh, uh, surfboard shapers in California and in San, San, and, uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, of course, here in Santa Cruz, is Doug Hout. And we had one of his best friends and partners, uh, Rich Novak, on, on the podcast. And Doug's made at least half my boards. And if I showed up at Doug's shop and I said, hey, Doug, I want to be a surfboard shaper, he'd probably tell me to go fuck myself. <laughs> but but l- l- let's say he didn't. There would be a multi-year apprenticeship. Yeah. You don't just get to, like he's a craftsman in the in the purest sense of the world word, right? I have a, a buddy named Jesse who's a master uh, home builder, and his his particular deep mastery is carpentry. He can frame a house. He built our house, right? And he's like a bare hands build the house guy. Yeah. Right, and if I said to if I said to Jesse, I said, "Hey Jesse, I, I want to learn to be a master carpenter." Like, there's a there's a program. Like, I, I'd have to shadow him. Yeah, tattooing is a great example. Yes. One of my favorite. You know, I love the tattoo sh- uh, TV shows. All the all those Ink Master and all that shit. Right, and because I love to see the development of the artist. Right, and yet my point is what I. What I love about what you're doing is you're taking that apprenticeship model to how you launch yourself into your career. Yep. So I've got this slogan that we like to use sometimes. Apprenticeships aren't just for welders. Startups aren't just for coders. And so what we focus on specifically, right now our niche is apprenticeships at tech companies, but for non-tech people. So we're talking entry level sort of sales, marketing kind of stuff. And so taking this this tried and true idea of apprenticeship and saying, look, it's not just for sort of skilled trades. This is how you learn to do everything. And most people just don't call it that. They just call it, you learn on the job once you get hired. But if you can go in deliberately with that mindset, it reduces the risk to employers to say, I'm going to bring you on for an apprenticeship period first. And it, and it sets the incentives and the mindset for the young person to say, I don't have a job. I've got an opportunity to earn a job. I've got this apprenticeship where I can learn and you can come in. And it also, what I, what I love about, you know, this market that we're reaching, it's all these people like you and me, because I saw you try to set up that microphone. We're non-tech people. (laughs) We're non-tech. Hey, just, just because it took me 40 minutes to set up the technical (laughs) gear because the software got upgraded and I couldn't figure it out. Doesn't make me a moron. (laughs) Does it? (laughs) So, like this this idea that software is eating the world, I think is absolutely correct and it's awesome. It's full of opportunity, not just for coders. There's so much opportunity to do the kind of things that you have done with technology companies, right? And so helping people, you know, I call them like blue collar entrepreneurs, the kind of people I grew up with in the Midwest, maybe their parents own a landscaping company and they know work ethic and they kind of know responsibility, but they've never dreamed big of working for some world changing company because they're like, I don't know, I'm not a coder, I don't, you know, and we're helping them see not only working at a place, but using that as a stepping stone to open your eyes to the opportunity 
for going out and then starting your own business or being a freelancer or so doing yeah, let, something. Let's, let's in the, drill into this for a second, yeah. Isaac. So, so in one dimension, you're helping me as a young person catapult myself, launch myself into a marketing career, or sales career, or sales ops career, or finance, or, you know, these things that don't always have a, a clear educational path like yeah. maybe a doctor uh, would. What's the entrepreneur angle? Because you're, you're also setting people up to be entrepreneurs. How do you do that? Yeah, that's that's how I see. I see that as like, these are the kind of young people who I think, you know, they're not ready to start a company, but in five or 10 years, they're going to be dying to start a company. They're, they're going to be like, okay, I can't take it anymore. I've been around entrepreneurs. Like, I need to do this now. And so I kind of see it as like, People who have the raw spark, and you can kind of tell people who have like, you know, they've got something in them that makes you think this, this person's got the entrepreneurial bug that either they're going to start a company or maybe they want to just go and create a life for themselves as like a freelancer or solopreneur in what I see as kind of the post jobs future. Like this concept of jobs is sort of fading away. Say say more about that, Isaac. So I think you know there's a there's actually a great book about it that I highly recommend by Taylor Pearson called The End of Jobs. Um, this idea that you pick a job, accountant. He's got a chapter called Being an Entrepreneur is Less Risky Than Being an Accountant, and he's like, you know, accountancy that's going to be gone in 20 years, right? Software machines are going to replace that. Have you heard <clears throat> now? I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit out of school because I've only I only saw we love out of school let's, smidgen let's go. yeah <laughs> smidgen about it, but apparently I I, I just read and I oh, shit um, companies like Intuit and other uh, I guess H and R Block and some of these other companies have lobbyists trying to keep the tax code fucking oh, yeah. intergalactically hard oh yeah and. <clears throat> And uh, our government right now, and again, I don't want to be political, but is trying to do some things to actually simplify filing. And apparently, I have read this in a number of places. Now, I'm not an expert, so look, this may make me an asshole. But my understanding is that some of these companies are actually working with the government to slow their progression to an easier tax code to make it easier for these fucking people as their uh, what I would call category potential diminishes. Yep. Uh, no. uh, did, did I read this right? No, that's absolutely right. So my brother used to be a, a, an accountant. He worked at a public firm, and then he actually left. He's a phenomenal entrepreneur. He started a company. Um, but he used to joke about this all the time. And I, and I always like to tell people, don't pursue a career where a change in law would make the entire industry irrelevant. <laughs> right if the whole if your whole yeah. industry is supported by absurd laws <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> that's awesome yeah if your value is our government did some really fucking fucked up shit and as a result there's a there's a new niche nobody wants to hire it's, me but you have to because of the law right that's not where you want to go you want to go where it's dynamic and where you're creating value so so back to this idea to me, it's kind of like, there's almost like a secret. There's like layers to Praxis, right? The On the surface, it's like, hey, look, we're going to show you how to win an opportunity. We're going to give you your first opportunity. And then we're going to coach you and, and help you leverage that into your next opportunity, right? But that first part, show you how to win an opportunity. That's the key because we're not giving you a job. We're showing you how to win opportunities, how to gain skills that are marketable to people and how to market those skills to people, right? Do you remember, what was that movie? Oh, for the love of... Um, was it Napoleon Dynamite? That's one of the greatest. It was Napoleon Dynamite, right? Where he looks at his buddy and he says, girls like guys who have skills. <laughs> Bow staff skills. <laughs> yes. I guess we got to get some skills. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so at some level, it's like, well, hey, girls and employers, it turns out, like guys who have skills. Yes, absolutely. So so really what, what you learn, you know, it's amazing when participants in the program go through the placement process where they're, where they're winning their apprenticeship opportunities and we're matching them up with business partners and they're showing them their personal pitch deck and the projects they've done to demonstrate their skill and their pitch video and they're doing interviews. After they've gone through that, which is a pretty intensive process, then they'll get an apprenticeship and they'll do it. If they decide they want to do something else, 
they are like amazing. They know how to go get a job. I just talked to a Praxis alumni who wanted to work at this new marketing company. And she found out that the founder loves Chipotle uh, burritos. Um, so she, so she. Some spent, of them she, <laughs> move through you very quickly. <laughs> she Chipotle, spent, <laughs> it may blast out the other end fast. <laughs> she spent a couple of weeks learning about the company and what kind of stuff they do. She ordered a Chipotle burrito, got some delivery service, paid him 50 bucks to deliver it personally to the guy's house with a note inside that said, enjoy the burrito with the extra guac. I want to work for you. Check your email. In the email, she had a whole pitch saying, I want to work for you for free for one month to show you what I can do. Bada, bada, boom. He called her back immediately. She's doing her free month right now, and she's going to earn her way onto the team, and they weren't even hiring. That's the way that, like, after going through Praxis, you start to learn. I'm not going to just wait for Indeed.com to have an opening and send a resume with 50 other people or 100 or 1,000 to win opportunities in creative ways. And so when you have that, the opportunity could be a job or it could be a client or it could be an investor for your company, right? And that's turning people into entrepreneurial thinkers so that they are not wedded to one establishment and say, boy, I hope they don't lay me off because that's the only way I know how to earn a living, right? They know how to create value. Yes. And I'm probably going to end up making people sick talking about how much I love my buddy Kevin Maney's new book, Unscaled. But the argument that he and Hamad Tamea uh, make in the book is essentially that as a result of, if, uh, if I remember right, they sort of start at the cloud and kind of come to where we are today and what we can see about what's possible moving forward. And as a result of those things, they build the following argument that I think has real legs, which is that size and scale have become a disadvantage mm. and that um, technology has leveled the playing field in a way that the individual youpreneur, solopreneur, and uh, the small e entrepreneur. Um, yeah, look, it's this simple, right? And look, I know they sponsor the podcast, but I don't give a fuck. If you are a growing company and you deploy NetSuite, well, you're deploying technology from one of the largest technology companies on the planet that has deployed that technology at a scope and size and scale that you could – like you can tap into something that you could never tap into before. Uh, my buddies at Zoom who I have no particular financial relationship with, right? Well, now you don't need to go to a fucking meeting. Dude, Zoom is ama- – we use it in practice all the time. Right. It makes these massive group discussions possible. It's beautiful. And, and these assholes that go to meeting and fucking Cisco, WebEx and all that, we would spend the first 15, 20 minutes doing all the technical mumbo-jumbo we did today, right? Zoom, you click on a URL, boom, you're in, done, end of discussion. And then, of course, uh, AWS is another ultimate example, right? Yep. Where, okay, it's the infrastructure Amazon uses – Netflix moved their fucking infrastructure to AWS. Like I, I, I get my head around like, w- w- what? What? Can you imagine how much <laughs> video? Like, blows your mind, right? And Bill and Ted's excellent new company can plug into AWS too. Yep. Yep. And, and and look, I'm a moron. I'm the captain of a media empire now. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, 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 and so on and so on and so. It's just when you understand uh, the scope of it and what Kevin and Hemant say is they, they, they introduce this notion of uh, that you are a personal enterprise. Yes, that's exactly right. We, we talk a lot about that. You know, um, I think Reed Hoffman has a book titled The Startup of You. And the title alone is just like perfect, that mindset. It's awesome. The Startup of You. And you think about all the things that a startup needs to do and you start to apply those on an individual level. It's absolutely unbelievable. And you've got configurations – We've never seen before. So I, I've got a friend with a company called VocaWorks that's just getting launched. That's It's basically for connecting people with not gigs, but like long-term gigs that are not full-time employment. So think of it as how people make movies. When you make yes, a movie, yes. Amen, you, get, hallelujah. you get like 20,000 people that are working on a single project for about a year or a year and a half with a massive multi-million dollar budget, as big as any enterprise would have. And then after that year, they all disperse. Oof. It's the way that, look, 
It's the way the construction it's industry. It's like flash mob business. You know? It's the way the construction industry works. You know, uh, uh, my wife and I are building houses now. And by the way, when I say my wife and I, what I mean is my wife is building houses <laughs> now, right? That's how that works. Uh, in her in her in her other career, she's an event planner. That's how, and that's all because information cost has come down. Once upon a time, going out and finding all these different specialists and bringing them all together quick enough, it would be so high cost that you just need one company that has them all in house. Well, and the interesting argument that Kevin makes in Unscaled is, um, if you go back to the mid to late eighteen hundreds, that's kind of that's the way it was, it was. Yeah. right? You were the butcher. I was the carpenter. Lots of people, of course, were farmers, barbers, you so name like, it. So it's like right? a return to a cottage industry. But what, what you mentioned, I heard the podcast with him. I love the phrase he used, and I'm going to get it wrong. But he's like, it's individual but at scale. So yes. it's not scaled like we're churning out uniform widgets to sell to millions of people. It's we're selling something individualized to millions of people so it's like individual, but at scale. No, and the crazy thing, and you know, uh, there's so many uh, interesting, I don't know what to call them, uh, synergies, or I don't know, I just call them maybe surprises in life. That's better. Synergies got a little too, too uh, much it of It sounds like some bullshit a stupid thing. management consultant <laughs> would say. And so it's just a surprise in life. It, 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 it is that... I'm experiencing this in real time too, right? Like uh, the thing about Legends and Losers that I never got, Isaac, was I, I was hopeful and intentional that conversations with the guests, you know, like, and, and, the, and the question to my mind was, A, would anybody ever listen to a dialogue show and, you know, because we weren't going to spoon feed them a bullshit um, and I'll throw them under the bus because they're they're big NPR fucking you know prefabricated <laughs> shit. Which and there's a bunch of that shit I like. But Hello, but we are now on NPR radio. Well, you know the, the crazy thing is, I, I'll throw another one I love under the bus. Sixty minutes, incredible show. But you know they'll shoot six hours of dialogue with a guest, mm-hmm. and you and I get six minutes of it. Yeah, you know that's bullshit. And the it, guest doesn't get to pick the six minutes. Or, you know, another one. I've had this happen before. No, exactly. <laughs> and you're like, whoa, whoo, <laughs> like, I, I, I dropped some amazing bombs in there and they're going to pick that? <laughs> you're like, yeah, well, well I, you know, it, it, that, that whole thing about being misquoted. It's like, well, you can't get misquoted on Legends and Losers because we fucking <laughs> dropped all of it. Or, you know, certainly most of it for fuck's sake. Um, and, and, and so the, the interesting thing, though, about all of that stuff is that um, – I had no idea how, and I don't don't know any other way to say it, an individual could scale. I somehow understood that I, I, you know, I spent 20 years as a small entrepreneur and as a marketing guy, and then I spent 10 years as a coach and advisor and a board guy, and then I, I, I'm not allowed to say retired because Walton whacked me for that, so I'm not retired anymore. And, 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 and I knew somehow that I wanted to make a difference at scale. Mm. And the crazy thing is, you know, I, I get emails from people in Norway and shit. We have a huge following of Legends and Losers in Australia that I, I think it was Von O'Connor. You're a global enterprise. Well, you know, kind of. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 but, you know, a niche one, I'm not confused. But there can the the beauty is there can be lots of them, right? Yes. Like like my wife Carrie spends a lot of time on Etsy. Yep. And she'll like buy you know because she does these corporate events and like she'll buy these incredible artisan gifts for people from the, you know she'll be taking people to I don't know Anguilla or fucking whatever, mm-hmm. right? And she'll find some artisan in Anguilla who makes I fucking necklace. I don't know <laughs> what what do I know, right? And she'll contract with them to make like, you know, 800 necklaces and shit, right? That, that's incredible. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's, you've got that, that one, this wonderful ability to take the sweet spot, which is a nexus of two things that you do well that a lot of people can do one of those well and a lot of people can do the other one well, but very few do both of them well, right? I was reading somewhere recently. I don't remember where. That if you do, I think it was a, like a Mark Andreessen blog post or something. If you can find two things to be in the top 25% of the world in, or three even better, 
Like that's where you're going to totally dominate because you're not going to be in the top 1% in any one thing, almost never. But you know, with all due respect to Mark, and I, I, I think he's amazing. um, How much cooler to design your own niche. Right. Like it's one thing to say, oh, I want to be one of the top 25% painters in the world. And it's a whole other thing to say, fuck that. I'm Pablo Picasso. I'm the first at cubism. So, so this is what I would see as a nexus of those. So like I was just reading a, a blog post by one of the Praxis participants that I don't know this guy that they're talking about. But apparently there's some YouTube channel. This guy's a blacksmith and he does some sort of blacksmithing, right? Now there are other people who are probably brought better blacksmiths than him. And there are other people who are better YouTube channel, whatever, YouTubers than him. But he's a blacksmith and he started a YouTube channel. So in that niche, yes. who, how many people are there that are good at YouTube and good at being a blacksmith? Very few. And so he's created this category of like wannabe blacksmiths. He's their guru, right? And now he's and, created a new category. And, and, and I love, to be clear, I love Mark for helping people break down that connection. I have a buddy <clears throat> and I've been on his show I'm just going to, next time I see Mark Andreessen, which is, you know, I've never seen him before, but <laughs> I'm going to be like, hey, you know who was talking shit about you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You'll, you'll tell him. No, I, I admire the shit out of him for a, 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 a ton of reasons. Um, and, and mostly, actually, this is diversion, but a reason that um, might not be obvious, which is we shared an old friend in common, Mike Homer. Huh. And Homer loved Andreessen. And I loved Homer. Yeah. Um, and obviously his accomplishments speak for themselves and yeah, how can you not admire that? But the thing I love about what you're saying around connecting one or two superpowers, um, one of, uh, the guys I've gotten to know recently through podcasting who I absolutely love, he's an intuitive category designer and he was uh, cool enough to have me on his show and he's, he's, uh, been on legends and losers. His name is Joe Sanek. Dude. You're serious? Joe Sanek? I love Joe. Practice you know of Joe's, the practice? Practice of the practice. I was in a band with Joe Sanek in college. No, no. You're kidding no, me. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> He's from Traverse City. He went to college in Kalamazoo, Michigan. We had a band called Second Floor Jungle where we played crappy folk music at like church youth groups and you coffee shops. you got to be kidding me. No, he's like an old friend. I had him on my podcast when he started uh, fuck. his thing. We're going to have to drop your That's episode insane. and his episode in the same week. No, I love him. And and I use him as an example all the time of this concept of yes. niche down because you look at it and go, you know, you tell me if I'm getting the story right. Yeah. He starts his counseling practice. Yep. Was it marriage counseling or? I, I don't can't know. remember. I think he was working in another practice, starts his own practice, and then he starts like total transparency blogging about building his practice. And here's how, how hard much, it is. Here's and how much money I make every month. Here's how, here's how I'm trying to grow it. Here's how I'm doing this. And all these other people who are counselors trying to launch their own practices start following him. He launches practice of the practice. He's got a podcast. Now they do a conference. Now that it's unreal. And, and, I, and I haven't kept up with him the last couple of years. So you know more than I do. Probably. No. And he's look, he's the mayor of Bonerville now. I mean, he's, <laughs> he, and you think about, you know, He's such a great example of, I think, both what Kevin's saying in Unscaled and I think what Heather and I are hopefully saying in Niche Down, which is, and and I think he's an exact example of what you're saying, which is, if you roll the clock back pre-cloud, it's not possible to be Joe. Nope. Because if you said, hey, here's here's my career Niche Down, here's my personal category design, I'm going to be the guy who converts his counseling practice into being the guru for other people who run uh, counseling practices. Yep. And, and I'm going to be able to find all of them. And it's going to, it's, even though it's super niche, it's uh, because I'm going to be able to find them all with relatively low friction. It's just going to scale and I'm going to be the man. Like that, that's not possible before. Nope. Right, but he can self-publish. He's a media company. He's a podcaster. He's all to your point. He writes. He does all this stuff. He's now he's got a conference and 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 the incredible thing, you know, there's a lot of people in the, uh, you know, the term I've landed on for it, Isaac, is entrepreneur porn business. Oh yeah. Oh god. The 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 conference junkies. Well, I'm not talking about the consumers. I'm talking about you know. I'll throw one of them. Under oh, okay, the bus, okay. To the one, the like, ones who put out all the stuff that's yeah, like like, a, like an idiot like Ty Lopez. Okay, yeah, you know, <laughs> that kind of moronic, uh, completely invaluable, 
uh, the advice is follow your passion and hustle, hustle, hustle. Like, really? And look at all my new Lambos. Like, I'm going to punch you in the face. You're a moron. I swear he was like designed in a lab. Someone like researched all the things that make people unable to resist clicking or whatever. And they just, because there's, it's, it's so in- incoherent. It's like. He's an entrepreneurial jungle. Kardashian. It's, it's, it's amazing. I mean. It, it's ridiculous. There's some. And so <laughs> at one extreme, there's this idiot who's the entrepreneurial Kar- Kardashian. And look, God bless him for his success. Yeah. But I, I actually think he's more harmful than helpful. But whatever. That's just my opinion. But at the other extreme, you have Joe, who's in this micro niche. And in my opinion, delivers insane value to that world. I mean, literally helping people who are counselors that they want to be entrepreneurs, but all they know is counseling. They're scared of the business and giving them a freedom and autonomy, getting them into entrepreneurship. And I mean, it's, it's an amazing thing that he's doing. Yes, Even and, if he only look, helped 10 people, let alone the hundreds or whatever, you and, know, and, thousands. And another friend of mine, uh, his name is Matt Atchkinson, but he goes by Matt EA mostly. And, you know, he's, he's a, he's a thug. <laughs> right he's a, he's a he's a he's a what do you mean by that he's, he's a, a ruffian <laughs> okay right who gets arrested and behaves badly and then decides yeah, i like him <clears throat> maybe exactly it's like ah let's get drunk and make bad decisions well you know so he did that as a young man gets into fights all that he's cute as shit too he's a handsome bastard <laughs> anyway blah blah yada yada he gets his life together and he becomes a real estate guy and a real estate flipper right and but he's a millennial and so I know there's like Grant Cardone and there's all these guys who are like the gurus in the real estate. And God bless those guys. God bless them. But Matty A carves out this niche as kind of the millennial flipper millionaire flipper dude. And he's adorable and he's articulate and he's really fun and funny and, and playful. And, and so to your point, he, he's, he's like a Joe Sanic for the millennial – uh, wanna be house flipper. Yep. Yep. And on and on and on, right? Well, and, and this is, it's amazing how much easier it is to access the kind of people that you want to access as well than you might imagine. So, and maybe at some point this will flame out, but right now I don't see any signs of it. Podcasting, there's this great secret that very few people know. Let's say you're really interested in, I don't even care, it can even be a technical thing, microbiology. And you want to really get knowledgeable and you want to build a network there and you want to, you know, learn from the best, whatever. One of the greatest, simplest tricks you could do is launch a podcast, a podcast about microbiology. Now, what this will do, your podcast doesn't need to get, it doesn't need to have any listeners. If you start going to all the leading experts in the world who have written all the books and done all the research and studies on microbiology and you pitch them, I want to have you on my podcast because your work is so fascinating to me. Guess what? They'll say yes. Because they don't get asked on a podcast very much. And now you will have an hour to monopolize some genius's time about something you're interested in. And you can repeat that 10 times, 100 times. And again, it doesn't matter if nobody listens to it. You have now built up a Rolodex of people because people are flattered by If you say, can I have lunch with you? They would say no. If you said, can I interview you on my podcast about your work? They'll say yes. It's amazing. So it's so interesting that you say that. I, uh... I heard this discussion between uh, Chris Brogan and John, James Altucher. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it was on Altucher's show. And Altucher was talking about how hard it is to get guests and how he's got a bag and he's got a this and he's got a that. And I was listening to this and I was going, really? <laughs> and I, I, so I'll tell you a quick story. Um, my wife and I were watching um, one of our favorite TV shows, which is called CBS uh, Sunday Morning. It's kind of like uh, – have you seen the show? Uh, I haven't. I don't usually watch the, the news. I don't want to hear about news. It's, it just depresses it's, it's me. newsy, but it's what they call a news magazine. Okay, and so, so if it's you think about like a more in-depth story on something. In-depth by TV terms, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and if you sort of think, you know, 60 Minutes – is on Sunday evening. Well, this is sort of 60 minutes in the morning. morning. Got it. Right? So it's a little lighter and it's not so much like tick, 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 everybody's dying in Syria and like, (laughs) ah! Right? (laughs) You know, it's it's more like, it's it's it's, and it's much more feel good generally. Although they do cover the news, but then they move into like, anyway, long story way longer. 
uh, they did this episode on on genius and the mind and so forth. And they have multiple experts on. And they have this guy named Dr. Darren Trefethert on. And he blows me away. And I, I, I played you that little clip earlier. And Carrie and I are looking at each other and we go, we've got to get him on the podcast. So at the end of the segment, like it's barely over, Google him. There's his website. There's an email. I can't remember if it was to him or to an assistant or whatever. <clears throat> and, and to your point, Isaac, I sent him this email, explained who Legends and Losers was. We've been incredibly blessed to have, you know, a handful of pretty big names on the show. So it's like, well, four-star general Stanley McChrystal and Bill Walton and Sebastian Younger and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he hits me back in a couple hours i would love to and here we are like who am i i'm a guy that got thrown out of high school and now i get to have i forget exactly how long but let's call it an hour and a half long conversation with the person who there's no question there's no debate (laughs) trefether is the leading expert in the world on savantism genius etc right he's the leading expert and you got him for an hour or whatever and he's he's beyond magical and to your point i i would set up the mics and do all the technical hee-haw just to be able to talk to him never mind share him with you know many many thousands of people yeah and so you know i go I, i circle back to something you said earlier which is do we all have to have a digital body of work so that when, whether it's an employer or a collaborator or a partner or a supplier or whatever, somebody Googles your ass and some shit comes up that says, this is a person of substance. The way I think of it is not, you have to, I think of it as, why would you not seize that opportunity? So it's not an assignment. You must do this or you will fail. It's an opportunity dangling in front of you to create things for yourself that you can't yet imagine. So, you know, I gave an example a while back. It's more about what comes into your mind. So if I've met you before, who knows what conversations I'm going to have in life and who I'm going to talk to? I'll talk to Christopher Lockhead, who's met Bill Walton. And then, you know, you get all these connections to connections to connections, right? Six degrees to Kevin Bacon and all that. If I have, if I don't, when I think of you, if I don't think, oh, that's the guy that's obsessed with baseball stats, then it will never come into my mind. If I hear you talking about baseball stats, I will never think to connect that person to you. And you don't know what you're missing out on if you don't let other people see what you're interested in. Yes. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's just something that like, you can't predict how it's going to play out, but why would you not? Make your interests, skills, and abilities findable. So I know the answer to that question for me, Isaac, um, pre-Legends and Losers. Now, this is probably different for virtually everybody who signs up for the Praxis program. You tell me. I couldn't figure out how to do it in a way that wasn't uh, Kardashian selfie, look at me, look at look me yeah. shit. Yeah, and And... and there's some things to this day I can't figure out. So, for example, I don't do Instagram stories. <laughs> I, I I just can't figure out. I, I can't figure out Instagram stories or Snapchat for the life of me. I can't. Ex- I don't have a Snapchat account. Yeah. I can't figure out what the fuck. Hey, uh, Isaac and I are at the beach and the UI on we're going face. for a walk and it's really awesome. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. Don't you wish you were us? Neener, nonner. Like, I can't. I don't know. I, I, and I think that's how a lot of people think of it. They think, well, I don't want to just like brag and like live blog my life. And I don't mean that at all. Or they think, well, I got to be an expert first. And I think if you start really simple, first of all, when, when you start with that as an objection. So part of the Praxis program, one of the months that we have is a 30-day blogging challenge where you post a blog post every day for 30 days. Now, that's not so much about writing. If you can do anything every single day for 30 days straight, you're already like in the top 1% of people in terms of discipline. Like that alone. So if I can get drunk on whiskey 
30 days. 30 days. days. <laughs> yes. I'm going to put you in the legendary category. But but one of the things people will be like, well, I don't know. I don't, I'm not an expert. I, or they'll try to like BS it and like write a post trying to pretend to be an expert in something. I say, look, first of all, you're not going to have any readers, right? You're going to have like five people look at your blog. So just don't worry about that. It's not for them. It's for you. Can you learn out loud in a way where you take it from the spot where you are and you say, hey, I just read this book about quantum mechanics. I didn't really understand it, but here are the things that I think I understood, whatever. I'm working my way through. Now you're learning out loud. Now let's say someday you're applying to me for a job and I'm digging around and I want to see what kind of person you are. How you learn and the way your self-awareness, being aware, hey, I'm not an expert, but like, oh, you took the time to write your thoughts about a book on quantum physics, even though you don't know about it. Now, no, maybe nobody will ever come across that, but maybe they will. And it doesn't have to be some posturing, pompous, phony bullcrap where it's like, hey, guys, check it out. I'm in here because I'm, I'm reading books all the time. I'm studying. Like, again, that's why I like your hatred for the word personal branding, because I think that, you know, evokes all these ideas of like laptop lifestyle, hashtag, you know, whatever. Like, no. Just be you, <laughs> like top be, be you, hashtag, whatever. you know, <laughs> like, and just allow who you are to be found. You know, it's so interesting. Uh, and I don't want to, well, I'm not going to say what I was, was in my head. I, uh, <laughs> well, maybe I'll say, I, maybe it's easy for some younger people, but I don't know that I agree with myself. But anyway, uh, we had, uh, Sequoia partner Jess Lee on the podcast. And I don't know how old Jess is, but 30s. Uh, Stanford grad, incredible education, comes out, joins a startup, ends up being made essentially what she calls a, a, a honorary co-founder, becomes the CEO. The company's called Polyvor, has a bunch of success, sells a company to Yahoo, and now she's a partner at Sequoia. And you just know, like, this gal probably needs a bre- neck brace because her brain's so big, you know, <laughs> she, she it might not. Right? Like, just insane, unbelievable success very early and all that. And it would be very easy for her to play a character. And I couldn't get over how open and how real and how honest she was about her fears and and her fears that like I might end up being a really shitty Sequoia partner and and I mean just living real in an open way like the opposite of I have all the answers maybe that's the best way to say it and I was struck by that Isaac you know that's funny that that reminds me of so when people think about building a digital footprint or a reputation. I think the first thing that comes to mind is doing stuff that will make more people like you. Okay, well, that's part of it. But they forget what's equally important is doing stuff that will turn away the kind of people that you don't want to work with anyway. So we'll have people ask us, for example, I have some people in the Praxis program say, hey, what do you think about like, if I swear? on my blog or on my podcast. Like, I don't want to turn away opportunities. And I'll say, look, you need to decide who are you and what, who do you want to be? And early in your career, it's probably, if you're going to err, err a little on the safe side, because you don't know what opportunities you're closing yourself off to. But ask yourself if some, if there were an opportunity to work with someone who refused to ever be around someone who swore, would you want that opportunity? And if the answer is yes, well, then don't close it off to yourself by publicly cursing. If the answer is no, I would never want to, my, Chris Lockhead could never work a job where people thought swearing was completely unforgivable, right? In that case, I could go do a speech. I could certainly go to a meeting and I, uh, I love to, you know, be around but it's clear from but what you do that exactly. like, it, it, if, it, it, if yeah. someone there's a finds, waiver you need to sign if we're going to work together. <laughs> if someone finds your podcast offensive, you are comfortable with not getting that opportunity. And so that's how I frame it. Like, look. And, and, and by the way, I hate to interrupt you, but no, no, go, you, on, go for on, it. on this one, what what I hear today is they go, oh, well, that's easy for you today because, like, you know, you already made it. And, rah, rah, rah. and and yes, that's true. It's easy to let your crazy off the chain once it doesn't matter whether you make another dime or not. 
But, and this is the big, important Kim Kardashian size, but I was that way always. Well, let's talk about risk in your case. You took a huge risk when you were like 18, 19. Everybody go listen to the first episode of this show, episode zero, if you haven't yet. You created a company with a fake guy's name, Roger <laughs> Pierce. Now, that's something you were comfortable with. Here's the risk. If someone finds out that's not a real person, they might think less of you. You decided that was a risk that was acceptable for you because you figured by the it's time funny, they find I never out, thought of right? the fact that he was a fake guy was a risk. I never <laughs> thought of that. I, and I don't know that Jack did either. There's some intuitive level at which you're comfortable with that. And I think if you're not, don't pretend to be. Like some people wouldn't be comfortable with that. They'd be like, I feel like if someone finds out, I'll feel really ashamed of myself. Okay, well then, then don't. Because you're not comfortable with that risk. No, and here's the craziest thing. Uh, no one ever asked. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? No, it is. And, and the other one, I, I was reminded of, uh, we had Dr. James Kelly on the podcast with um, John Berghoff. Just two awesome guys. Uh, uh, Kelly's got a great podcast. I met him on his podcast. It's called Executives After Hours. And he has subsequently written a book that is very legends and losery. Uh, called the crucible's gift you know all about like what we do when life kicks us in the nuts or even not necessarily kicks us in the nuts but we have like a seminal moment yeah. right yeah um and uh he and Berghoff were here and we were doing what you and i are doing and <clears throat> you know he's a phd in marketing right and like i don't have a phd in marketing not even close <laughs> um and, and he was, as I remember, he was really surprised, Isaac, that no one ever asked, and Berghoff doesn't have much of an education either, as he, as he says, I've always chosen the path of self-education, he likes to say. Um, but he lived in a world where he felt like everybody wanted to know about that, and that if you didn't have that box tick, you were kind of fucked. And my attitude was always, to your point uh, earlier, I'm Christopher Lockhead. Go fuck yourself, <laughs> right? Like <laughs> you, sh you highlight, and and we have a lot of participants who don't have college degrees. And at first, they'll be like, "Okay, well, you know, how do I frame that?" And what? And I'm like, "Look, you don't ever have to frame it. If you lead with, hey, I built this for you, and I want to work with you, no one's even going to ask. If you lead with, let me tell you what I don't have. I don't have a college degree." Well, then they might ask about it. But if you lead with, let me tell you who I am and what I do Early have, in my career, nobody, care. nobody asked me. Well, so I, this is one of the greatest lessons I ever learned. I worked for a guy. and Working for small business owners was such an amazing experience for me, which is part of why I want to help more people have this experience with working with entrepreneurs. But I was like 16, 17. I worked with a guy. He had this company. My brother and I worked for him. And he would just like go snowmobiling and hunting and we would run the company. <laughs> And we would go around to businesses, mostly car dealerships, and we would run cables, telephone cables and computer, like high-speed internet cables before Wi-Fi. And one thing I found that was amazing, we had little polo shirts with a logo on them that uh, said, you know, Encore Communications Incorporated. I'm like this baby-faced, you know, 17-year-old kid. I walk in with a tool bag and with a polo shirt, and I would walk into a car dealership and I would say, hey, where's your computer room? And they would just say, here it is, and give me the key and unlock it every time. They wouldn't add, like, I had a polo shirt. and Because the first time I did it, I said, um, I, have a, I think I have an appointment. Um, would you show me the controller? I, I need to talk to them. And they made me sit there for like half an hour. And they were like, all, finally, I was like, you know what? Forget this. Next time I came to a dealership, I was like, show me where the computer room is. I'm fixing some stuff. Oh, yes, sir. And they like take me and just like, un I could have taken down their whole, you know, point of sale system or whatever. But you just, if you display what you do have, a tool bag and an official looking shirt. No one asks what you don't have, it's which crazy, was skill because I didn't have any. <laughs> yeah. One of my favorite quotes, and I, I, I hate that I can, I, I can't remember who said it, but who you are speaks so loudly, I can't hear what you're saying, right? Yes. If you look the part, you act the part. Yep. And it's not about lying, again, because if you're like, you know, if you're going to lie about something and then get busted and you can't back it up, well, that's going to set your reputation No, you have to be really a person far. of substance. You got to know that, like, push comes to shove. I'm willing to put myself in a position where I've got to kind of back this up at some point. But don't worry about what you don't have. Focus on amplifying what you do have is, I think, the takeaway from that. Yeah. Well, this has been an unbelievable conversation. Um, anything else before we kick out of this wave? 
No, man, I just, uh, I love it. I mean, you're, you're, I'm a talker. I'm a little overly chatty and you're one of the few guys that I feel like can go toe to toe. <laughs> <laughs> so are you saying we have the same disease? Or? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, this is awesome. I mean, I, I, if anybody is interested in checking it out, you can go check out the discoverpraxis.com. Um, you know, and again, what we're, what we're doing is we're trying to help young people launch careers that will let them get that first step going in the real world and let them learn how to go out and create opportunities well, for themselves. And, and what I love, Isaac, you, uh, you did what every great entrepreneur and category designer does, which is you, you discovered a missing, you had an aha, which is for certain types of, uh, young people, there's a disconnect between wherever they end their education and where they need to start their career and, and, and potentially get on the entrepreneurial path. And you're trying to fill that hole. And that's unbelievable. Well, thank you, man. So I want to thank you for We're that. just getting started. Yeah. Be legendary, my friend. I will. Woo-hoo. That was a good one. Uh, very, very eye-opening. And um, I, I love that co- that guy. And I love that conversation. And if you think there's someone in your life who would also love it, why not share Isaac with them right now? Uh, you can email this episode right from your smartphone or wherever you're experiencing Legends and Losers. And we would love you just a little bit extra if you shared it on social media. Um, Now, our good friends at NetSuite want to help you succeed and turbocharge your growth. One of the main reasons companies fail is not being able to support growth. Uh, I've seen a ton of companies with massive category potential fail because they couldn't execute. And as their category was taking off, you got to be able to have that category battle. It's one thing to design the category. It's a whole other thing to win the battle and become the category queen. NetSuite is a deep and wide set of capabilities that help you manage every aspect of your business in an easy to use, easy to implement cloud platform. And NetSuite is surprisingly cost effective. Now for legends and losers listeners, NetSuite is offering a free 60 minute business growth review with an expert in your industry where you can talk about what the opportunities are, what the barriers are, and ultimately how you can turbocharge the growth of your business. You'll learn about how to new, how to acquire new customers, how to increase uh, profits by looking at your margins and other key financial data, get a handle onto the visibility of your cash flow, your receivables, your payables, and all that good stuff. So check out netsuite.com slash legends to schedule your free growth review today. All right, we would like to thank the good people at Praxis at discoverpraxis.com. The Miracle Morning, written by our friend and the amazing Hal Elrod on episode 91 of Legends and Losers. Check it out, it'll uh, it'll change your perspective and uh, pick up a copy of The Miracle Morning. It's one of the most popular books in the world for a reason. The official coffee of Legends and Losers is Verve Coffee. Verve Coffee Roasters right here in beautiful Santa Cruz, California. They are the leaders in West Coast craft coffee. Um, You can check them out in Santa Cruz, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Tokyo, and always at vervecoffee.com. HarperCollins Instant Classic Play Bigger, How Pirates, Dreamers, and Innovators Create and Dominate Markets. And the new book by Heather Clancy and myself, Niche Down, How to Become Legendary by Being Different. Our good friends at Equity Directory, connecting startups to the talent they need. If, you're, if you want to work with startups, if you're a startup looking for talent and you're willing to take most of your compensation in equity, check out equitydirectory.com. The amazing people at onelifefullylived.org, the nonprofit helping you dream, plan, and live your best life. Uh, one of my favorite podcasts the new Jordan Harbinger show with our friend and guest on episode 135, the incredible, the uncomparable Jordan Harbinger. A company I love and recently made an investment in, 70millionjobs.com. All of us can use a second chance in life, and it turns out that ex-cons make great, deeply committed employees. Yeah, I said it, ex-cons. Check it out. Uh, We had Richard um, uh, Bronson on the podcast. He's an amazing guy. And he's doing an amazing thing. Check out 70millionjobs.com. And my good friends at Interview Valet, if you're a thought leader, get your leading thoughts on some podcasts at interviewvalet.com. And the good people at Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières. 
They do incredible work in some of the most challenging, difficult, terrible places on planet Earth, and they need your help. One dollar will make a big difference. Doctorswithoutborders.org. All right. We'd like to remind you that this podcast is the sole property of the Legends and Losers Oddcast Network, and we would love it if you shared the shit out of it. All rights do remain disturbed. We must warn you that this podcast is clearly produced in a studio that does contain nuts. Please teach kids entrepreneurship. Remember, there's no such thing as a participation award. Tom Waits was right. Go get your surfboard and paddle out. Listen to John Lennon. Don't be lame. Get out of the passing lane. Don't forget to call your mom and dad. Buy only pasture-raised, free-range eggs. When you buy something else, you're supporting horrible farmers. Hey, man, that suit is you. And remember, there's no stopping the Cretans from hopping. Thank you, Dandy Candy. I love you, Mom and Dad. And hey, Colin, this oddcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go out to Marcus Rust, the CEO of Roseacre Farms. Sorry, Marcus. We just ran out of time for you. That's it. Thank you so much for uh, investing part of your life with us. It means the world to me and everyone at Legends and Losers. And we're out of here. We'll see you again soon on another episode.